I do not blame the words, for they, as it were, choice and precious vessels. But I do deplore the wine of error which was poured out to us by teachers already drunk. And, unless we also drank, we were beaten, without liberty of appeal to a sober judge. And yet, O oh my God, in whose presence I can now with security recall this, I learned these things willingly and with delight, and for it I was called a boy of good promise. Chapter 17 Bear with me, O oh my God, while I speak a little of those talents, thy gifts, and of the follies on which I wasted them. For a lesson was given me that sufficiently disturbed my soul, for in it there was both hope of praise and fear of shame or stripes. The assignment was that I should declaim the words of Juno, as she raged and sorrowed that she could not bar off Italy from all the approaches of the Teucrian king. I had learned that Juno had never uttered these words, and yet we were compelled to stray in the footsteps of these poetic fictions, and to turn into prose what the poet had said in verse. In the declamation, the boy won most applause whose most strikingly reproduced the passions of anger and sorrow according to the character of the exercised my wit and tongue. Thy praise, O Lord, thy praises might have propped up the tendrils of my heart by thy scriptures, and it would not have been dragged away by these empty trifles, a shameful prey to the spirits of the air. For there is more than one way in which men sacrifice to the fallen angels. Chapter 18 But it was no wonder that I was thus carried toward vanity and was estranged from thee, O my God, when men were held up as models to me, who, when relating a deed of theirs, not in itself evil, were covered with confusion if found guilty of a barbarism or a solecism, but who could tell of their own licentiousness and be applauded for it, so long as they did it in a full and ornate oration of well-chosen words? Thou seest all this, O Lord, and dost keep silence, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth as thou art. Will thou keep silence for ever? Even now thou drawest from that vast deep the soul that seeks thee and thirsts after thy delight, whose heart said unto thee, I have sought thy face, thy face, Lord, will I seek. For I was far from thy face in the dark shadows of passion, for it is not by our feet, nor by change of place, though I either turn from thee or return to thee. That younger son did not charter horses or chariots or ships or fly away on visible wings or journey by walking so that in the far country he might prodigally waste all that thou didst give when he set out. A kind father, when thou gavest, and kinder still, when he returned destitute. To be wanton, that is to say, to be darkened in heart, this is to be far from thy face. Look down, O Lord God, and see patiently, as thou art wont to do, how diligently the sons of men observe the conventional rules of letters and syllables, taught them by those who learned their letters beforehand, while they neglect the eternal rules of everlasting salvation taught by thee. They carry it so far that if he who practices or teaches the established rules of pronunciation should speak, contrary to grammatical usage, without aspirating the first syllable of hominem, onimen, thus making it a human being, he will offend men more than if he, a human being, were to hate another human being contrary to thy commandments. It is as if he should feel that there is an enemy who could be more destructive to himself than that hatred which excites him against his fellow man, or that he could destroy him whom he hates more completely than he destroys his own soul by this same hatred. Now, obviously, there is no knowledge of letters more innate than the writing of conscience against doing unto another what one would not have done to himself. How mysterious thou art who dwellest on high in silence! O thou, the only great God, 
who by an unwearied law hurlest down the penalty of blindness to unlawful desire. When a man seeking the reputation of eloquence stands before a human judge while a thronging multitude surrounds him and inveighs against his enemy with the most fierce hatred, he takes most vigilant heed that his tongue does not slip in grammatical error. For example, and say, inter hominibus, instead of inter homines. But he takes no heed lest, in the fury of his spirit, he cut off a man from his fellow men, ex hominibus. These were the customs in the midst of which I was cast, an unhappy boy. This was the wrestling arena in which I was more fearful of perpetrating a barbarism than having done so of envying those who had not. These things I declare and confess to thee, my God. I was applauded by those whom I then thought it my whole duty to please, for I did not perceive the gulf of infamy wherein I was cast away from thy eyes. For in thy eyes what was more infamous than I was already, since I displeased even my own kind and deceived with endless lies my tutor, my masters and parents, all from a love of play, a craving for frivolous spectacles, a stage-struck restlessness to imitate what I saw in those shows. I pilfered from my parents' cellar and table, sometimes driven by gluttony, sometimes just to have something to give to other boys in exchange for their baubles, which they were prepared to sell even though they liked them as well as I. Moreover, in this kind of play I often sought dishonest victories, being myself conquered by the vain desire for preeminence. And what was I so unwilling to endure? And what was it that I censured so violently when I caught anyone except the very things I did to others? And, when I was myself detected and censured, I preferred to quarrel rather than to yield. Is this the innocence of childhood? It is not, O Lord, it is not. I entreat thy mercy, O my God, for these same sins as we grow older are transferred from tutors and masters. They pass from nuts and balls and sparrows, to magistrates and kings, to gold and lands and slaves, just as the rod is succeeded by more severe chastisements. It was then the fact of humility in childhood that thou, O our King, didst approve as a symbol of humility when thou saidst, of such is the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 19 However, O Lord, to thee, most excellent and most good, thou architect and governor of the universe, thanks would be due thee, O our God, even if thou hadst not willed that I should survive my boyhood. For I existed even then, I lived and felt and was solicitous about my own well-being a trace of that most mysterious unity from whence I had my being. I kept watch, by my inner sense, over the integrity of my outer senses, and even in these trifles, and also in my thoughts about trifles, I learned to take pleasure in truth. I was averse to being deceived. I had a vigorous memory. I was gifted with the power of speech, was softened by friendship, shunned sorrow, meanness, ignorance. Is not such an animated creature as this wonderful and praiseworthy? But all these are gifts of my God. I did not give them to myself. Moreover, they are good, and they altogether constitute myself. Good, then, is he that made me, and he is my God. And before him will I rejoice exceedingly for every good gift which, even as a boy, I had. But herein lay my sin, that it was not in him, but in his creatures, myself and the rest, that I sought for pleasures, honours, and truths, and I fell thereby into sorrows, troubles, and errors. Thanks be to thee, my joy, my pride, my confidence, my God. Thanks be to thee for thy gifts, which do thou preserve them in me. For thus wilt thou preserve me, and those things which thou hast given me shall be developed and perfected, and I myself shall be with thee, for from thee is my being. End of Book One Confessions 
by St. Augustine.